Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's Friday Explorations Read Aloud. I'm Joseph Cote, and I'll be your host today. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, we have a very special book to date that uh, uh, is dear, near and dear to my heart, so I'm going to read something special to you. Uh, but let me give you a little background. Uh, in August of uh, 1993, Let's go back in time, a little bit of time. With my bags packed for a new job assignment in Istanbul, I decided I needed a, a good booster shot of American wilderness grandeur. Uh, and I fell in love with New Mexico. From my uh, tiny but historic Beacon Hill apartment in Boston, I signed up for a wilderness men's group adventure. Mm a leftover from the 70s, if there ever was such a thing, and uh, headed out to Jemez Springs, New Mexico, on the edge of the spectacular Vallas Caldera National Preserve, 72 miles west of Santa Fe. Absolutely stunning area in New Mexico. Amazing, amazing beauty. Now, following six days in the wilderness with a bunch of strangers uh, playing pioneers, I, uh, I fled uh, like the state bird, the greater roadrunner, over the hills and through the woods to Santa Fe. And it was love at first sight. After four days, I promised to return. Now, let's fast forward. May 1996, following a... Uh, particularly stressful job chapter in Singapore, I followed the blinking beacon light a total of 9,248 miles back to Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I rebooted for a glorious two years. And parenthetically, I did the same after a focused role at London's forever stylish Savoy Hotel in 2006, a shorter distance of 4,939 miles back to the high desert of northern New Mexico and my favorite flannel shirts. Having grown up in Old Town, my childhood memories of times with my Native American friends of the Penobscot Nation on what was always respectively called Indian Island, those memories resurfaced when I was introduced to one of my new associates a member of the Acoma Pueblo in New Mexico, 125 miles to the southwest uh, of Santa Fe and one of the two New Mexican Pueblos on my must study list. The other one was the Taos Pueblo against the spectacular foothills of the Rocky Mountains in Northern New Mexico. In a total of five years of a most, most memorable life chapter and experience in Santa Fe, New Mexico, it was the Acoma Pueblo high atop a 375 foot flat sandstone mesa at 7,000 feet above sea level that captured my soul and indeed my spirit. Over time, I was most fortunate to become as welcome atop that mesa as an outsider possibly can be, except on September 2nd of each year for the Pueblo's Acoma Fiesta, when the public is invited to walk the one road up all 375 feet to the top of the mesa. And it is the story of that Pueblo and its resilient, proud people of nature that I wish to share with you today. My personal and heartfelt salute to National Native American Month. The book we're going to read today is called The Origin Myth of Acoma Pueblo. It was written by Edward Proctor Hunt, or actually he dictated it tell you that story in a moment. And this has been edited by Peter Nabokov. Let me just read to you a couple of things from the back of the book, which I always think is wonderfully succinct. Hailed by many as the most accessible of all epic narratives recounting a classic Pueblo Indian story of creation, migration, and ultimate residence. This version of the Acoma Pueblo creation myth offers a unique window into Pueblo Indian cosmology 
and its dramatic ancient history. It reveals how one pre-modern society answered key existential questions and formed its guiding social, religious, and economic customs. In 1928, it was narrated by Edward Proctor Hunt, a Pueblo Indian man from the Mesa Top village of Acoma, New Mexico, to Smithsonian Institution scholars. In the, this new edition, Peter Nabokov renders this important document into clear sequence as excerpted material from the original storytelling sessions and explains the creation and roles of such central myths in American Indian culture. Now, a little bit about Peter Nobokov. Um, he's an anthropologist and a writer. Um, he has conducted ethnographic, uh, ethnological research with Native American communities throughout North America, particularly in the plains of California and in the Southwest. Uh, he is a professor of American Indian Studies and World Arts and Cultures, great title, at UCLA. So with all of that uh, preamble, let us begin here. Uh, the creation of creation myths is a short preamble just to put it as a, in perspective uh, before I actually read you the section on the particular creation myth of this incredible uh, Native American Pueblo. Stories about the origin of any community's universe, its gods, spirits, heroes, and landscapes, its beginnings, wanderings, sufferings, and fulfillments are the most important accounts any society can tell itself about itself. They are its divine charter, declaration of independence, constitution, and bill of rights, all wrapped into one guiding narrative. Like a cosmic compass, they set its course. They provide models for its institutions and remind its people who they are, why they exist, and how they fit into their grand scheme of things. As foundational narratives, these stories are sometimes dramatized, usually from members only, and at regular moments on the community's ceremonial calendar. They are also recalled as scripts or formulas for conducting proper rituals. And they can be revisited whenever their teachings seem most relevant. Constituting what some call original instructions, such myths inform their constituencies how to behave and move forward in order to remain their unique social selves. They are declarations of all that the culture considers primary, true, and essential. Contrary to the popular use of the term as human invention or falsehood, myths of this magnitude are usually considered as sacredly revealed, repositories of ultimate truths and arbiters of existential questions. Most of the world's major narratives of cultural genesis have cohered over time out of a cluster of separate and often older narratives. And commonly, commonly these separate stories, focusing on the establishment of this or that constituent group or cultural practice, wind up being told in multiple ways. Sometimes this is because through the invocation of these myths, individuals, societal divisions or priestly elites not making some case or claim and hence they might add, subtract or alter elements in them. For these reasons, it is usually futile to search for a single originating or seminal version of any culture's creation story. They have grown out of portions told by different people at different times for different reasons. Whenever outsiders study any culture's origin myth, they generally try to compare the fullest array of what are called a myth's variant expressions. 
whether in lengthy or fragmentary forms, in order to identify their most abiding and widespread elements and to understand the various influences that may have weighed on them over time. Throughout human history, it has been out of such bundles of separate stories that gifted narratives or big thinking synthesizers, special interest groups or nationalizing committees have tried to compose single dominating accounts of creation, the emergence of human society and the relationships between gods and humans. The culture keepers and storytellers behind such master myths have hailed from various backgrounds. Some were men and women of a rare philosophical or historical bent, or they possessed exceptional memories or storytelling gifts. Some suffered a physical impairment that kept them home. So their full-time job became as community historian, memory bank, or renowned bard. Others may have occupied a privileged religious status or played a noteworthy intellectual or political role in their community. And then there are those individuals whose culture, cultural exposure was so broad that they enjoyed access to an unusually wide range of separate accounts. Such seems to have been the case with Edward Hunt the narrator of this version of the Akuma creation story. Different motivations have driven storytellers to compile such authoritative accounts. Given the powerful impact of creation myths on how people believe or act and the likelihood of multiple versions and the contradictions among them, it is inevitable that some have maintained that there should be the true or dominating one. Sometimes select groups or scribal specialists authorized a single orthodox or revised standard account and attempted to sideline or even outlaw all others. But for an outsider, all versions tell us something about the complicated and unruly strands, stories and histories that reveal the community's development and its evolving sense of itself. In the remote past, the activity of transmitting central stories and their teachings from one generation to another happened orally in line with the mouth to ear origins of human storytelling. These transmissions introduced all manner of additions and changes following the oral transmissions and subsequent elaborations and additions of more stories sometimes came their consolidations into single versions. Often their contents were altered even more by their exposure to creation stories from other cultures, whether the changes were adopted by choice or imposed by conquest. Then or thereafter, these oral narratives were further condensed as they were fixed into some form of writing or print. And following their conversions from oral to written media, oral stories, origin stories, frequently underwent a fourth transformation. They wove their way into distant societies through the error prone work of translation from one language to another. Whether these transformative processes were imposed upon the traditions of small scale pre industrial face to face cultures or contributed to the sacred text of complex societies that produce the so called world religions, the evolution from oral to written forms usually took a while, often hundreds, sometimes a thousand years or more. In the case of this Pueblo Indian myth, however, it's summarizing, narrating, translating, and transcription was completed in about eight weeks. Yet the stories that it contained had been accumulating in the mind of its narrator since he was a child at Acoma Pueblo in Western New Mexico. The world this myth created. The society that emerged out of this creation and migration narrative is found in today's Valencia County in Western New Mexico, 
about 60 miles west of present-day Albuquerque. As established in the myth's closing scenes, the village called Haako, H-A apostrophe A-K-O, Haako, commonly referred to today as Old Akama, by adverti but advertised in tourist campaigns as Sky City, sits on the flat summit of a 375 foot high uh, sandstone mason. Just to put that in perspective, that's about a 37 story building. Its earthen colored buildings and oversized San Esteban church appear to grow out of the rock itself. The 17 acre Mesa top is surrounded by clusters of immense sandstone monoliths. This rocky ensemble sits in the midst of a flat plain whose backdrop of low cliffs is interrupted by broad valleys. To the east rises Katsimo, or Enchanted Mesa, whose summit was once occupied by Akuma's ancestors. This panorama makes for one of the most dramatic town sites in the Western atmosphere and hemisphere. Encompassing a 245,672 acre reservation with its old Mesa Top village and two satellite communities, Acoma Pueblo is one of 19 autonomous Pueblo Indian tribes in New Mexico and Arizona. Because these towns centered around open plazas and their buildings were multi-story, condominium-like structures built of mud and stone, the earliest Spanish visitors in the 16th century found them familiar and called them Pueblos. At nearly 7,000 feet above sea level, with an annual rainfall of between only 11 inches and 16 inches a year, the high arid desert that drops eastward from the Colorado Plateau is a tough place to make a living. The people of Acoma combined dry and irrigation farming techniques, it developed individual and collective hunting strategies, and gathered a host of wild foods. Even then, drought, famine, enemy attacks, and European-derived diseases made for a precarious existence. Today's Pueblos are direct descendants of cultures whose ancient ruins can be visited in the cliffs of Mesa Verde and the creek bottom of Chaco Canyon. Scholars often define these Pueblos into the Western villages, embracing the Hopi, Zunai, Laguna, and Acoma territories and the Eastern or Rio Grande Pueblos, which extend from Taos Pueblo near the Colorado state line down to Isleta Pueblo, just south of Albuquerque. Now, in contrast to plaza-centered Pueblo villages, which cluster around a communal space, Acoma is a street-type Pueblo. Facing its three alley-like byways are eight house blocks with its cross-axial plaza more a widened corridor between two streets. Although much remodeled today with one-story single-family houses increasingly crowding to the Mesa Rim, the old-time two- and three-story blocks step back with each tier. In the presence and practice of passive solar heating, their southern exposure allowed the sandstone and adobe walls to absorb the sun's warmth by day and radiate it inside during the night. Combined with small, relatively smokeless fires, their cocoon-like sleeping rooms kept families comfortable over the winter. In warmer months, their people dried meat and native fruits in the sun and visited and socialized beneath an open sky often in the shade of dividing walls on their roof terraces. Acoma's positioned in the center of a Pueblo Indian world that extends from the Rio Grande River in New Mexico to the Painted Desert in Arizona. 
Its social and religious institutions reflect the influences of both its Eastern and Western neighbors. It is one of the seven Indian Pueblos that speak dialects of the Kerasan language. Like the Western neighbors, the Zuni and Hopi, the community features a clan-based society and contains multiple rectangular kivas, or sacred meeting rooms. But Akama's medicine men societies enjoy the kind of prominence usually found among the Eastern, or Rio Grande, Pueblos. While the Pueblos farmers practice the dry farming methods of the West, coaxing irregular plots of maize out of apparently waterless, sandy basins, at their satellite farming villages also maintained irrigation ditches, as were more commonly found along the Jemez and Rio Grande River valleys to the east. Today, the people of Acoma have largely re relocated off the Mesa, occupying housing projects and dispersed homes in and around the colony villages of Acomita and Makartis. Some have resettled in towns like Grants and Albuquerque. But over the winter, a few families are assigned to reside on the summit to maintain a symbolic presence and fulfill ritual duties. But most Akaba families still remain house and room rites on the Mesa, where they return for the yearly round of ceremonies and feast days. Some festivities are open to the public, but others are off limit to outsiders. A living architectural shrine, old Akama remains the spiritual pivot of the tribe's universe. While Akama Pueblo may be, as its tour guides claim, the oldest continuously operating set settlement in North America, archaeologists allow more cautiously that the Akama cultural province has received residents for a very long time. First were stone and bone tool using paleo Indians who lived in the region more than 10,000 years ago. Around 5,500 BC, the extended residence of archaic period hunter gatherers began. They later settled on mesa tops and valleys and adopted gardening as a secondary food source. Now by AD 400, they were evolving into the culture now referred to as ancestral Pueblo. Their farming practices, belief system and fertility and harvest rituals developed in the great house ruins of the Four Corners region of New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, and Utah. But a convergence of factors, drought high among them, cast their inhabitants on various roads toward the south and southeast. As early as AD 950, some of these early migrants appeared along the San Jose and Puerco River valleys with Acoma Mesa itself settled by the 1400s. The village's written history began in 1540 when a scribe of Hernando de Alvarado's exhibition into the Southwest wrote home about this, quote, strange place built upon solid rock. He described its defensible locations and at least seven ladder and stone step trails to the summit where piles of stone were readied to rain down on invaders like him. Near the edge of the mesa, freshwater cisterns, cisterns held ample snowmelt and rainwater. Stored within the house blocks lay enough dried corn, meat, and fruit to sustain its people for up to four years. It's truly remarkable. Over the following decades, decades, the Spanish traded for Acoma food and sought to convert the Indians to Christianity. 
relations uh, soured in 1598 after Mexican-born Don Juan de Ornate authorized to obtain the Pueblo's permission to a submission to the Spanish crown, developed doubts about its loyalty. His suspicions were confirmed when his nephew, Juan de Zaldivar, and most of his platoon were killed by Acoma warriors, their arrows, clubs, and rocks. In retaliation, Oñate dispatched, dispatched Juan's brother, Vincente, with 70 armor-clad soldiers and their cannons. In the late January 1599, the Spanish committed one of the bloodiest revenges in Southwestern history. The three-day punishment of Acoma ended with more than 600 dead Indians and a village in rubble. Documents describe the Spanish sentencing survivors over 25 years of age to amputation of a foot. With other males and females between 12 and 25 condemned to 20 years of servitude. By then its population was down to around 1500 members. Despite these brutalities, 30 years later, a priest named Fray Juan Ramirez somehow rallied townsfolk, tribal tradition says forcibly conscripted them, to reconstruct the church's 10 foot thick adobe walls, harvest its ponderosa pine rafters from the San Mateo mountains and complete the 40 foot high roof for New Mexico's largest church, San Esteban del Rey, atop a 375 foot mesa, remember, whose much rebuilt and restored edifice still towers over the mesa. Over the next half century, life at a weakened Acoma remained relatively isolated and peaceful. With other Indian pueblos that lay closer to Spanish scrutiny, a wave of religious suppression against heathen practices intensified. Sacred kivas were destroyed, ceremonies disrupted, spirit masks and ritual regalia burned, and native priests and medicine men publicly whipped. Among them was a religious leader from San Juan Pueblo named Pope, P-O-P-A-Y. With rebels from other villages, he secretly organized what became the All Pueblo Revolt. One day in early August, 1680, most of the loosely connected Pueblo Indian world, spreading across 400 miles, rose up against Catholic missions and Spanish ranchos. In this most successful of American Indian uprising, Acoma hurled its priest, Lucas Maldonado, to death on the rocks below. All told, 19 Catholic missionaries and nearly 400 Spanish colonists were killed. The survivors fled into old Mexico. Although the region was reconquered by the Spanish 12 years later, the authority of Catholicism was never the same. The Pueblo Kivas and Christian churches came to conduct parallel, sometimes entwined celebrations but native waves of belief, ritual, and theocratic organization now held sway. By 1820, as Mexico took over the American Southwest, and 30 years later, when the United States assumed control, Acoma's population kept dropping. Yet its people maintained their time-honored rhythms of growing corn, squash, and tobacco. Hunting for rabbits and antelope, harvesting wild foods, and fulfilling the ceremonial cycle that regulated their lives. The next threat to Acoma's isolation was the Santa Fe Railway, which cut across Acoma and Laguna Pueblo lands in the early 1880s. Pueblo women began selling pottery along the tracks, and Indian dances and arts were advertised by railroad publicists. Generations of tourists became exposed to what one writer has called the romantic inflation of Pueblo life. 
In the early 1920s, Acoma joined with fellow Pueblos in successfully opposing federal legislation that attempted to legalize the thousands of non-Indian squatters. Over the next 40 years, its population steadily increased. But Acoma remains ambivalent about embracing a modernizing world. At the foot of the Mesa, visitors and exhibits uh, are, are located in orient, with orientation films at a museum before a tram takes them up to the old village for a tour with native guides. Outsiders are welcome to attend the September 2 annual Acoma Fiesta, but for key rituals and dances in their old religious calendar, the old village is closed off. Always hovering over the community is the challenge of how to remain a semi-sovereign, religiously private, Kherasan-speaking, traditional Pueblo people within a wired, multi-ethnic, open access world. We talk about Edward Proctor Hunt, may strike you as a strange name for a member of the Acoma Pueblo, let me explain. To appreciate this version of Acoma's origin myth, one must review its narrator's unconventional career. Born four months before the onset of the Civil War and dying three years after the end of World War II, his successive names were Daybreak, Edward Proctor Hunt, and Chief Big Snake. While the 1942 publication of the myth attributed the work only to a, quote, group of Pueblo Indians from Acoma and Santa Ana visiting Washington in the fall of 1928, end quote. A glance at a 1957 Smithsonian report on Pueblo Indian music suggests the storyteller's identity. Its frontispiece featured a photograph of the Edward Hunt family troupe in their outfits of plains, Indian war bonnets and heavily beaded shirts vests, and leggings. The stories that Edward Hunt braided into this narrative were so packed with details because he was so steeped in his tribe's lore. He was the stepson of a fire society, medicine man, but regarded the man as his father for the rest of his life. Four days after his birth, he received the first of his four initiatory experiences. His body was held up or given to the rising sun. And he was named Gaia, G-A-I-R-E, meaning first light of dawn or daybreak. Next, like most Pueblo boys around the age of five or six, he was inducted into the Katsina Society. That training taught him the mythic origins of the rain-bringing supernaturals called Katsinas. They were spirits of the ancestors who lived in the clouds and meditated between human and cosmic worlds. They brought rain, health, and all good times, and were impersonated by initiated members only. Behind their masks and regalia, the boy learned were his own relatives and neighbors. The injunction to keep this secret was driven home. Katsina rituals also taught daybreak songs and prayers and life lessons that were reinforced by seasonal ceremonies and stories told over long winter nights. His third ritual experience was less predictable. When daybreak was around 10, a bucking horse knocked him unconscious. He seemed dead to the world. The family prepared him for burial in the Campo Santo, the old low-walled cemetery that lies in front of San Esteban. When rays of sunlight woke him up, the lad's near-death experience signaled his candidacy for a medicine men's society with its tough training and ritual duties. 
Daybreak's life might have, might have unfolded in this traditional vein, but for the arrival in late 1880 of a Presbyterian missionary who persuaded a number of parents, his included, to release their children to a new Indian boarding school in Albuquerque. There the boy's hair was cut, his body clad in a Civil War style uniform, and he began, began a regimen of dormitory life, marching drills and language and math classes. He helped to construct the school's new building, maintained its vegetable garden, sang in the choir, prayed before meals, attended Sunday services, and was forbidden to speak his language. One day, the school received a box of donated clothes. In the pocket of a coat received by daybreak was a Bible with a note that allowed the finder to take its owner's name. Edward Proctor Hunt. But three years later, Catholic authorities, jealous of Presbyterian claims to their flock, pressured his parents to withdraw him. Edward rode a flat car home on the new Santa Fe Railway. With other boarding school returnees, he was taken into a kiva and whipped for speaking English, having short hair, wearing leather shoes, and following white ways. Then Edward found himself bound for a second institution, St. Catherine's uh, Indian Industrial School in Santa Fe, which had just been founded by Catholic missionary, later to become America's second saint, and Philadelphia heiress Catherine Drexel. Here, Edward used skills learned at Albuquerque to help build its original classrooms and dorms as well. But his stay lasted less than a year. His stepfather's death in August 1887 returned the young man home to Acoma and a final initiation. As eldest son and pursuant to the old man's dying wish, Edward was indoctrinated into the Koshades, Akama's Brotherhood of Sacred Clowns. It was during this lengthy training that he learned a major portion of the origin myth he tells in these pages. In late August 1928, as we fast forward, Edward began narrating the myth, first to visiting British anthropologist C. Darrell Ford, then with the brand new chief of the Smithsonian Institution's Bureau of American Ethnology, Matthew W. Sterling. For this task, he was uniquely qualified. As a medicine man's son, an initiate into the Katsina Society, a candidate for becoming a healer himself, a member of the Hunter's Society for Killing a Bear, and an initiated sacred clown, Edward's exposure to Akama's esoteric law, law was broader than most. In Washington, Edward shared what he knew of his people's world, the tribe's ancestral locations, the creation of its characteristic animals and plants, and other features of Western New Mexico's cultured ecology. His exposure to Catholic and Protestant texts added echoes from Christian cosmology, people made in the image of God, creation by the word, temptation by an evil serpent, committing a sin and a universal flood not trained to identify or analyze all that they were hearing, Ford and Sterling found themselves also recording a medley of Akama genres, sacred creation stories, magical songs, prayers, and side plots, and stories of primordial migrations, legendary wanderings, and the tribe's ultimate arrival at its current location as a distinctive ethnic group. For about two months, the hunts appear to have worked almost every day. Both of Edward's sons, 26-year-old Henry Wayne Wolfrobe 
hunt, and 21-year-old Wilbert Blue Sky Eagle hunt, aided in translating the basic text, as well as the songs, they were an integral part of it. The fourth member of their group, Philip Sanchez, adopted from the Pueblo of Santa Ana and nicknamed Silver Tongue because of his beautiful voice, was coached so the Smithsonian could record them. In addition, Henry, an aspiring artist, drew pictures to illustrate the document. After the Washington sojourn, the Hunt family made Albuquerque its home base, but traveled wide, widely. Over the Depression years, they exploited the country's passion for Indian lore, patching together a living as entertainers and education, educators for Boy Scout groups and school districts throughout the South and the Midwest. By the 1940s, Edward and Marie, his wife had retired to the suburban of Albuquerque home while their children created their own careers, which included work as telephone linemen, railway shopmen, jewelry makers, touring showmen, and trading post proprietors along famous and infamous Route 66 between Oklahoma, New Mexico, and even California. Five years before his father's death from stomach cancer on February 13, 1948, Wolf Robe Hunt learned from his Tulsa, Oklahoma newspaper that the Smithsonian had recently published Edward Hunt's version of the Akama origin myth. He wrote his scholar friend, the linguist John P. Harrington, for copies for himself, his dad, and my younger brother, Blue Sky Eagle Wilbert, who is with the army somewhere. Some years later, not knowing that the old man had died, he wrote Wolf Robe again. Unaware that photographer Edward S. Curtis and ethnomusicologist Francis Densmore had publicly named his father as one of their key informants, in his response, Wolf Robe expressed concern that Harrington protect his family's identity by not talking about their Smithsonian work. As for myself, Henry said, I am away from home and have been for a number of years, although I visit each year. I feel as I were merely an interpreter for my dad. Then he added, as if privy to the personal toll on Edward Proctor Hunt of passing through such a gauntlet of identities, of course we know no one can hurt dad now. With all of that background, now let me tell you the myth. I felt it important to know so much of the background of the Akamar people, as well as the man who finally in 1928 was able to report this myth. Uh, so the stories Edward told. Edward's account of the ethnogenesis of the Akama people forefronted them as the Earth's original humans. Their ecology as the Earth's first landscape and their mesa top village as the center of the world. His narrative followed two sisters, mothers, as they climbed upward through three underworlds until emerging upon this earthly plane. It traced the creative work of one of them, Iataku, as she guided her Indian children to create their world and culture and launch their migratory search for a permanent home. Of the eight traditional myth types for world creation, which folklorist Anna Birgitta Roth identified across North America, Edward's narrative exemplifies the drama of the emergence, which predominates across the Southwest. Most Pueblo people suggest that their first appearance on the new Earth's surface occurred at the mythic site of Shipapu, S-H-I-P-A-P-U, located in the so-called Four Corners area where the states of New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, and Utah intersect. Part one, Iataku's world, opens in darkness, three levels below the earth. 
up above the earth, the sun and other features of our world already exist. Almost as an aside, we learned the world was born when a supreme progenitor hurled a blood clot into space. Less interested in ultimate or metaphysical beginnings, however, the narrative quickly turns to cultural unfoldings. From below the place called Chipapu, two supernatural sisters climb a series of trees toward the light. Guiding them is a female spirit, Shishtinako, or Thought Woman. After teaching them their language, she hands baskets to them. These contain seeds to plant, as well as animal effigies, representing the many creatures that they will bring to life. The girls present a dramatic contrast. Iataku, or bringing to life, is the elder. Darker skinned and a slower thinker, she belongs to the corn clan. Narsita, or more of everything in the basket, is lighter complected and has a quicker mind, and she chooses the Sun Clan. She is described as lazy, greedy, and rash, Iataku as industrious, forbearing, and gentle. Not Sitnikta's basket contains foreign items, domesticated animals and plants, metals, written words. Iataku's holds features of the environment for sustaining the Akama people to come. Now unfolds an inventory of creation, the myth's litany of the first this and the first that. As they mature, the sisters learn about the sun's movement, how night follows day, how to orient themselves in the four directions, and how to use fire, corn, and salt so as to cook and feed themselves. They plant seeds to feed the animals, make mountains to support the trees that they will cut to roof their homes, and plant other seeds to feed themselves. Through song, they animate the fetishes so as to create game animals which will feed the fetishes that they bring to life as prey animals. From birds to fish, turtles to water snakes, gradually they bring the world alive with creatures and places. After Natsita is impregnated by a rainbow snake, she bears twin sons. Taking one of them, she heads east and there produces white people. Back at Chipapu, the other son grows up and marries his aunt, Iataku. Their offspring will parent the Akama people. Iataku then groups the successive generations into the clans that eventually will number varyingly between a dozen and 20. With the spirit Shishtinako abandoning her, Iataku must create the rest of Akuma cosmology and culture on her own. She establishes the spirits of the four directions, who will dispense the four seasons, assigns Katsina spirits to rule the clouds, and teaches the new people how to summon them with prayer sticks. With magical words, she creates their distinctive Pueblo architecture their domestic houses, central dance plaza, and ceremonial kivas. Instituting a men's hunting society, she sets rules for the killing and butchering of game and creates few new fetishes and rituals to help hunters be successful. From generating and nurturing, Iataku moves to governing. She establishes the office of war chief and country chief. When an evil snake reappears with plague, she institutes the five medicine men societies with their altars. They learn to use ritual objects so as to alter the course of events, bring their near dead back to life, and even make rain during severe droughts. To add spice to human life, Iataku introduces a counter force, sacred clowns, called koshari. They behave boorishly, interrupt sacred activities, mimic dignitaries, 
do things backward and provide relief from the seriousness of ritual life. They teach people to have fun, to hold public dances, play ball games and run kick stick races. Having armed her people with this foundation, Iataku sends them to their next village location at the place known as White Horse, speculated to be today's ruins of Chaco Canyon or Aztec, New Mexico. But there the diversion she taught them proved their downfall. The men become addicted to a hide and stick gambling game whose songs disrespect other men's wives and even insult Iataku herself. Hurt and angered, Iataku prepares to depart, but not before alluding to the prospect of her own death. Only in the afterworld will she reunite with them. Finally, she leaves instructions so that people can find their ultimate home, Haako, which lies to the south. Abandoned by both Iataku and her katsinas, the people suffer drought and famine until a good man saves them. Element by element, each in proper sequence, this section has produced the Akuma physical world. Artifact by artifact and practice by practice, it has also created their cultural world. Covenants have been decreed between humans and spirits and between humans and nature. Now, Iataku's children possess cosmological principles, survival skills, religious and political practices, rituals for healing, a social identity, and an ethnical structure. Future rituals by humans will recapitulate the symbols and acts that are this section's dramatic arc. So her people will now when, know when they have reached their destination Iataku instructs early on that when they believe they have reached Hako, they must yell out loud. A clear echo is the signal that they have finally arrived. In addition, she gave them two eggs, one plain and whitish, the other a beautiful blue. From one will come crows, from the other parrots. Upon reaching Haako, they are to divide into two groups by choosing between the eggs. One band will stay and the other will continue traveling southward. Bereft of the Atakus guidance and the Katsina's support, the people finally arrive near Haraku or present day Akuma Mesa. Until now, they have escaped the consequences of their bad behavior. Will impulsive human nature disturb their lives again? The opening of part two, Birth of the War Twins, has a familiar ring. Much as Natsita has, was impregnated by wet drops from the rainbow serpent, now the sun god impregnates a young girl with pinion nuts. The duo of Iataku and her absent sister and the latter's two boys are joined by a third pair of newborns, Masiwi and Oyoyewi, sons of the sun. When their protective energies are needed, they are exalted as the hero twins. But when their ferocity goes too far, they become threats to community stability. The boys mature unusually fast and acquire remarkable skill with weapons, first as hunters, later as warriors. Eager to meet their son father, they are aided by Spider Woman, apparently an avatar of the spirit Shishtinako, who originally helped the two girls. She guides them in their magical journey to the sun's home in the sky. They must endure tests before their son father acknowledges his paternity, praises their mettle, and grants them superhuman killing and healing powers. At the beginning of part three, the War Twins' world, Harmony at White House has been restored and the War Twins are living peaceably among the people. From Iataku's children of myth, 
The people have transformed into a historical band of migrants who must take responsibility for their lives. But a disrespectful younger generation upsets things once again. They revive the gambling game with its rowdy songs and mocking imitations of katsinas. The spirits retaliate, causing a terrible war between spirits and humans that seems to be unparalleled in the annals of Pueblo mythology. Rallying to their community's side, the twins help to kill nearly all the casinas. Although they come back to life, their human victims do not. Traumatized, the survivors face a dilemma. How can mortals and supernaturals possibly interact after such destruction? Their planes of existence are complementary and inter interdependent, yet clearly they must dwell physically apart. Then the Katsina chief comes up with a brilliant solution. A sacred drama will mix ritual, stagecraft, masking, and the willing suspension of belief. But impersonating spirits is no simple matter. Participants must become more than actors. As described in many Indian folk tales, bad behavior or improper conduct of rituals runs the risk of leaving them permanently stuck between realms. During their masked visits in the plaza, streets, and kivas, the impersonated spirits bring otherworldly powers into a human community. The gravity of such appearances is counterbalanced by the levity of sacred clowns. They allow the townspeople to enjoy vicariously the sort of fun making that once cost them so clearly dearly. As the clowns mock the katsinas, everyone smiles them out to a collective release. Yet these delight makers, as early ethnologist Adolf Bandelier labeled them, borrowing from a phrase by the famous scholar Frank Hamilton Cushing, also distract the people from observing the keynote Katsinas too closely, lest the true identities of the individuals who are personifying them be disclosed. For the next misfortune to befall the people, however, a disease with blisters. There is no retrospective explanation. No one appears to have misbehaved. Indeed, history may have intervened here in the form of the early 16th century smallpox epidemic, which native demograph demogra demographer Russell Thornton suggests spread from Northern Mexico to the Southwest in 1520. To counter the plague, the people migrate to Sage Basin, reestablishing their buildings, the plaza and their kivas. Then a visit by some Katsinas revives the bad behavior of disrespectful men yet again. To avoid a repeat of the earlier bloodbath, the village war chief comes up with another solution through the medium of performance. The community will reenact the terrible war with the Katsinas. Its stage prop will be a curtain of dried buffalo hides representing the village walls. Some will play the part of invading casinas, others the defending villages. The war twins will participate as well. In the ensuing melee, these performers performing as invading casinas will pretend to die, but the actual mockers will pay with their lives. After angry relatives of the dead split off, the rest move to yet another location. Tool Lake. A new medicine society purges the site, a new village emerges, but drought and famine return nonetheless. Falling back on their old war role as community saviors, the twins sneak into Katsina country to steal weather controlling medicine. The Katsinas retaliate with storms and floods. The people save themselves by ascending a mountain. Only when the twins shoot arrows at the waves do they subside. From now on, nothing will deflect the wandering people from their search for their predestined home. Carrying Iataku's oracular eggs, they pie past the site of future Laguna Pueblo, camp at Antelope Range, then visit Hardwood Pass, and finally reach 
Katsumo, also known as Enchanted Mesa. All the while they maintain the cycle of dancing, praying, and planting associated with the agricultural year. For the twins, one adventure remains. Sounding as if Hunt has inserted a folktale into his epic, the two clash with the evil gambling spirit of South Mountain. Humbled at last by this chasing experience, they are beset by the same kind of fears as ordinary human beings. Finally arriving at Haako, the people locate the clear echo and learn who is to stay and who must travel southward by choosing between the two eggs. Thinking that by, tick, by picking the attractive blue egg, they will be associating with the beautiful parrots, most select the blue. But when they crack it, crows burst forth. While this contingent will remain at Haako, those aligned with the white egg, which yields colorful parrots, splinter off, presumably into old Mexico. Accepting punishment for their impetuous actions, the twins submit to a purification ritual. This institutes yet a third ceremony for the people to practice in the years ahead. The scalps of their victims are appropriate appropriated so enemy spirits cannot haunt their killers, and at the same time so Pueblo warriors can be honored for bravery. Disconsolate about facing a future as inactive commoners, the twins disappear into a rock near the mesa's edge. Still encamped at the mesa's foot, the people prepare for their ascent to its summit. Rather than conducting their arrival in a spirit of triumph, they make this final move with reverential stately care. First, the medicine men clear ants, centipedes, and snakes from the surface. A main rainbow trail up the mesa is purified and marked by prayer sticks. Additional offerings are deposited where the seven kivas are to be constructed. After building the house blocks, Country Chief and the Antelope Clan establish the freshwater cisterns. The village's guardian beings, mountain lion, bear, green frog, and snake, are assigned their corner places, as if replacing the role of the twins. Then comes the moment for everyone to ascend the completely kerneled long ear of corn, a metaphoric designation for Akama Mesa itself. Arriving by the blessed trail, the medicine men receive village officials and the antelope clan. Next come the people, clans and societies, each assigned their specific homes or meeting places. With the people observing every ceremonial detail, the entire settling in period consumes two days. Here they dwell for a long time. Quote, year after year, they continued to go through their ceremonies. With a final sentence, Edward ends his narrative like a ribbon snipped by scissors. This is as far as the tradition is told. An amazing story of an ancient people brought up into today's world. And if you ever can make your way to New Mexico, I suggest you add that to your bucket list. And when you do, plan to go in late August so that you're there on September 2, the one day where we outsiders are welcome to walk or take the tram up the one dirt road that still goes to the 375 foot high mesa where the buildings and the church remain to this day. Such an amazing piece of history and my personal salute to National Native American Month. Thank you so much. Please join us next week 
we will be back with an enjoyable story by a main writer that you soon will not forget. Thank you. Have a good week. Stay warm, but more important, stay healthy. Goodbye.